Hi, this is Fernanda here, ready to continue to read Chasing Vermeer by Blue Belliet. Before we begin to read, though, I wanted to share with you a couple of artists that were mentioned while Petra and Calder were in the Art Institute of Chicago. So I'm going to share my PowerPoint again. And oops. <laughs> this is always a trick. All right, let's see. Let's start from here. So they talked about Edgar Degas and his dancers. And this, oh, hello. Let's do it. There we go. There is Edgar, Edgar Degas was famous for painting these beautiful dancers. So that's one of his, his um, paintings. And then he talked about Claude Monet's haystacks and bridges. So I just put up one of the haystacks, which are just beautiful. And here is the piece that they talked about, the Gustave Caillebotte from 1877. It's actually hanging in the Art Institute of Chicago. I love how she uses real um, art and its real placements. So this is the one that Petra was talking about, this rainy street in Paris. So anyway, I just wanted to share that with you. And let's continue reading. Chapter five starts in my book on page four, 43. It's called Worms, Snakes, and Periwinkles. That night, flipping around lo in low, Petra was more and more amazed. She had never seen a book like this. It was, first of all, peppered with quotes from journals and newspapers around the world. There was the London Times, the Quebec Daily Mercury, the New Zealand Times, the Woodbury Daily Times, the New York American, the Gentleman's Magazine, the Ceylon Observer, the list went on and on. There were hundreds of stories of bizarre happenings, many of them similar. Venomous snakes dropped into backyards in Oxfordshire, England. Red and brown worms fell with snowflakes in Sweden. Bushels of periwinkles, which are like snails, fell from the sky on Cromer Gardens Road outside Worcester, England. Luminous floating lights traveled slowly over, an op over open land in North Carolina and in Norfolk, England. Wild animals turned up where they shouldn't have. People disappeared and then were found far away, disoriented and confused. There were crashes and explosions that no one could explain. Fort, remember that's the name of the author of that strange book, had apparently spent 27 years going through old newspapers and libraries. He had copied out thousands of articles about unexplained goings on. It is the profound conviction of most of us that there has never has been a shower of living things, but some of us have been educated by surprises out of much that we were absolutely sure of. Petra read this twice and turned a few pages. I have never heard of any standard in any religion, philosophy, science, or complication of household affairs that could not be made to fit any requirement. We fit standards of, to judgments or break any law that pleases us to break. We have conclusions which are the products of senility or incompetence or credulity and then argue from them to premises. We forget this process and then argue from the premises, think, thinking we began there. So here he's just saying that we think we know what we're talking about and sometimes we just um, talk about things and then we, and then we um, talk ourselves into believing things, right? And sometimes it's the opposite. Petra struggled with this language and had to look up the words credulity and premises. Credulity means believability and premises meaning the location that you're in. Top, top of page 45. Rereading each sentence in pieces, she began to get a grip on what Fort was saying. Depending on how you looked at things, your world could change completely. His thought was that most people bent over backward to fit everything that happened to them into something they could understand. In other words, people sometimes twisted what was actually in front of them to fit what they thought should be there never even realizing they were doing it. People liked to see what they were supposed to see and find what they were supposed to find. It was quite an idea. And then see London newspapers, August 18th and 19th, 1921. 
innumerable little frogs that, it, that appeared during a thunderstorm upon the 17th in the streets of the northern part of London. Farther down, there have been repetitions of these arrivals. There is an account in London Daily News, September 5th, 1922, of little toads, which for two days have been dropping from the sky at chalon sur saint in France. Could this be true? Why wasn't more time in school spent studying things that were unknown or not understood instead of things that had already been discovered and explained? Miss Hussey always asked for their ideas. Wouldn't it be great to go digging for weird facts like Charles Fort did? To try to piece together a meaning behind events that didn't seem to fit. And why wasn't this book a piece of art? She grabbed her notebook and began to write. This object is hard on the outside and bendable on the inside. It is the color of an unripe raspberry and it weighs about as much as a pair of blue jeans. It smells like a closet in an old house and it is an ancient shape. It holds things that are hard to believe. There are living creatures falling like rain, objects that float by themselves. People vanish and reappear. It is made of substances that once grew, that once bent in the wind and felt the night air. It is older than trips to the moon or computers or stereo systems or television. Our grandparents might have seen it new when they were young. There was a woman's name in faded brown ink inside the cover. Petra wondered who else had loved this book and why it had ended up outside Powell's. Why had it been thrown away? She would never lose it, not ever. Before closing the book, she looked again for the one terrific sentence, we shall pick up an existence by its frogs. Hours later, under a sliver of, a, of moon, Petra was almost asleep. As she rolled over, squashing her pillow into position on top of her arm, a strange thing happened. Although her eyes were closed, she seemed to be looking at a young woman. This person was old fashioned. She was dressed in a yellow jacket that had dapp dappled fur on the edges, and her hair was pulled back tightly with shiny ribbons. Dangly earrings, perhaps pearls, caught the light. She had been sitting at a table and writing. Something had interrupted her. Quill pen in hand, she had paused to look up. The woman was gazing directly into Petra's eyes. Her expression was knowing, filled with kindness and interest, and she had the look of someone who understood without being told. Petra found herself soaking up every detail of the image. Although the room was dark, light touched the metal fastenings on a wooden box, a fold of blue cloth on the table, the curve of a woman's forearm, the creamy lemon of her jacket. This was a calm, deliberate world, a world where dreams were real and each syllable held the light like a pearl. It was a writer's story, it was a writer's world, and Petra was inside it. And then, as suddenly as she had appeared, the woman began to fade from Petra's mind. As this happened, Petra felt recognized, as if this person knew who she, Petra Andeli, was. It was a shocking feeling, exhilarating, shivery, true, and somehow inevitable, as if things had always been this way. Wide awake now, Petra thought of Charles Fort. Was he responsible for this woman's visit? Had he brought them together? Educated by surprises, Fort understood what Petra often felt. There is much more to be uncovered about the world than most people think. If she'd had any idea how much more, Petra wouldn't have slept at all that night. We're going to stop there, but I want you to think about like some crazy things that you think might have happened and that didn't happen, weren't really real, or you thought they were something strange and then you changed in your mind to make it fit into something that you believed. And hopefully you've had a look at the woman in the page there, right? Yeah, and I love that the pearl earrings keep coming back because remember when I showed you one of Vermeer's most famous painting is the girl with the pearl earring. It's something to think about.